Welcome, and thank you for joining today's webinar as we focus in on how we can't stimulate our way out of recovery and how consumers are adapting to the new spending environment of fear and safety. This conversation is taking place on Thursday, June 18th, 2020. We are pleased today to have Patrick Slattery join us as he discusses changes to planning and measurement as a result of responding to and recovery from a crisis. Patrick is founder and managing director of Canopoc, a CFO advisory firm in New York City. He has over 20 years experience leading and envisioning finance transformation initiatives. Thank you for being here today, Patrick. Thank you. And as always, we have Andrew Duguay here. He is Previdary's chief economist, and he's going to share his latest insights with us. Thank you for joining us, Andrew. Thank you, Chrissy, and I'm happy to kick off today's discussion and be a introduction and lead into what Patrick has to say about the, the changing environment, both from the business and the consumer. Uh, today's focus really is going to be on some of those changes that we're observing about the new environment that this has caused uh, due to COVID-19. Now, we, we know it's obviously created a lot of disruption with uh, mandatory closures of businesses and then the slow reopening of them and a lot of focuses on how well businesses are opening up and whether people are gonna go shopping again. I think one of the important aspects of this economic crisis is really how, at least over the near term, and I think, as we talk about the second half of the year and even into 2021, how so much of consumer spending is really dictated by the fundamentals of do people feel safe spending money and how much of spending money is, it could be put on hold or paused or discretionary. You know, we, have, we happen to live in a very wealthy nation and, and what that means is that a good chunk of our spending is discretionary in nature. And so we're gonna study some of those dynamics that seem to be coming out of the data recently uh, surrounding uh, consumer sentiment as well as spending trends by different income categories. So let's start by looking at a measure of consumer confidence. Uh, from Prosper Analytics, we have the, the latest data from June that shows confidence has rebounded slightly from May, but is still at very low levels. Obviously, we're still in the middle of a global health pandemic. The number of new cases in the United States has subsided from its peak, but in many states, it, the number of new cases is still rising, which is causing a lot of uncertainty and I think a lot of turmoil in people's confidence in, in the economy and the recovery and for their personal safety. One thing this has done, and I know there, there is a, a lot of socioeconomic uh, stress that is going on in the country right now, but one thing that this has done, it has basically united us in our pessimism, if you will. Uh, what we have displayed here is um, consumer confidence by different income stratifications. So taking a higher income group uh, with household incomes above 75K, looking historically normally, that means more money, more confidence, right? And you see that that orange line tends to always trend higher uh, than those who are, I would call, you know, middle income category, that 35 to 75K, and then lower income below 35K. But the interesting thing is, is that since the crisis happened, what you said, that the gaps have shrunk between the confidence and happiness of those who earn more money and the relative uh, less confidence of those who have less money. Uh, they have all gone down, but the, the, nut, the gap has actually shrunk by um, about two thirds uh, between the higher income and the lower income gap, low, going from February a 19 percentage point gap to about a seven percentage point gap in June. Um, I think what this tells us is that whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you live paycheck to paycheck, or whether you have some in savings, your confidence uh, in the overall uh, economy and in your spending really has to do with how you're feeling about health and safety. And this has really been backed up by a recent study by a group called Opportunity Insights. It's, it's a, a sponsored program uh, from Harvard University and Brown University, and they're white paper, which was just published yesterday, um, really talks about 
uh, studying the the number one uh, restrictions on U.S. economic growth right now, and they determined that it wasn't necessarily government mandated closures of stores. It wasn't in inadequate incomes because we've actually stimulated um, uh, in, in, oh, and compensated for incomes quite well in the United States uh, with the expanded unemployment benefits. And it wasn't a lack of business liquidity um, given that, that the Fed has poured trillions of dollars uh, into the market uh, to help uh, back up the liquidity of the financial markets. What it was is the fear of COVID-19 itself that was suppressing consumer spending, and that was the primary barrier to economic activity. Uh, uh, some of the data from their research on some of this real-time uh, spending information really backs up this consumer confidence uh, metrics that I just showed you, uh, is the fact that the biggest reductions in spending right now are actually from the high income spending group. So lower income spending since uh, this, this is all uh, indexed to January, so pre-COVID times, um, lower income spending has declined about 4%, but higher income spending has declined 17%. So we're seeing that those who are more well off are actually cutting their spending more, both in dollar terms and in percentage terms, which means that they are just, sim I think, simply reducing the amount of spending they feel comfortable doing because uh, higher income categories spend more on discretionary items and those are the things that they're cutting back on and if you look across categories right it's entertainment travel uh, uh, restaurants all those things that are really getting uh, cut back so what this tells us is that it's it's not necessarily the ability to spend right now that is really driving the economy lower it's that confidence in spending and so we talked last week about uh, the importance of looking at soft data and consumer confidence, I think so a lot of this might support that. Uh, the fact that if people do not feel safe and they do not feel like they're taking uh, unnecessary risks by going out and traveling and spending money, they're not going to, and that's going to suppress the economy. And this ha this is what has effects on the job market right now. What we see is that in high wealth areas, there's been more workers that have been laid off relative to lower wealth areas when you break down zip code by zip code across the United States. So this makes for an interesting dynamic where lower wage earners uh, are actually feeling more of a pain if they live in a high wealth area where maybe in traditional um, recessions, if there is such a thing, uh, you might see that well-off areas uh, tend to spend uh, during recessions and, and tend to be okay economically versus uh, those areas that are more concentrated around lower incomes. What we're seeing right now is that the, the cutbacks are really from those high income earners uh, and that's really driving the economy lower. And this has impact for everybody, right? Uh, and, and because of all those jobs that even in high wealth areas that get supported. So what does this mean? Well, this means that reopening only has a modest impact on economic activity. What we really need to continue to focus on is the number of cases. And this is where we lead into uh, a challenging slide to observe. And this is the, uh, the number of new cases with the red being increases in cases over the last two weeks versus the blue being where cases are subsiding. And what we see is that yes and places along the east coast and northeast we're seeing that cases have been declining however we are seeing that cases are starting to increase in a number of other states including california florida texas which means that these states despite the fact the efforts to reopen businesses means that more likely consumers are still not going to feel safe going out until we start to see the number of cases subside or some real progress in some vaccines uh, in order to protect people and get them back to their previous habits. So all of this shakes up the consumer, which also shakes up the business. And, and so as we transition over to Patrick to talk a little bit more about business strategy, I just wanted to highlight are an update to our economic outlook uh, is that you know we are still very concerned about the number of cases not declining and so despite the fact that you might see some headline news that um, jobs or retail sales have bounced back somewhat from April numbers uh, we have to keep in mind that we still have a long journey out of this and we should still see 
uh, major economic disruption through the summer months into the second half of the year. And we still think that, you know, when we talk about the, the shape of the of the downturn, we're still sticking to a, a U-shaped recovery. I mean, and we're still acknowledging that there's still great downside risk because of this health crisis and the fact that we're, we need to first and foremost see those health crisis numbers subside before we see a true economic recovery. I think some of this latest data, latest data on consumer spending and the psychological um, fear that's driving cutbacks uh, does support this theory that we it, we if we don't see the enough reduction in the number of cases, people are not going to return back to their old habits. So what does this mean for business strategy? For that, I'm gonna turn it over to Patrick to continue the conversation. Thank you, Andrew. You're right. Uh, this entire period of time has been one crisis and, and actually a layer of crises if, if we look at it from a social perspective in addition to the COVID health crisis. I'd like to put it in the context of uh, a profession that deals with crises on a regular basis, and that's the cybersecurity profession. And uh, if we go to one of the frameworks that's become a standard there, the NIST framework, there are basically five steps in NIST, and they break down into three steps that are all about organizing what you know and how you run your business to avoid a problem. And then two steps that happen in a, in, in a space that cyber professionals refer to as right of bang. And what do we mean by right of bang? Right of bang, as the chart that's up shows, is what happens after the crisis has occurred or the crises have occurred. And they're basically two major steps of activities that, that you go through. The first being respond, right? The immediate response to the crisis. And, and dealing with the, the immediate effects of the crisis and mitigating any of the uh, any of the immediate damage. Beyond the response, there's the recovery, and I'd like to talk about that a little bit. But let's let's first look at respond, and we can jump to our next slide. What happens during respond? Well, basically, as I said, it's it's if you can think of um, a house catching on fire as a kind of crisis that you'd apply this model to. During respond, you're fighting the fire. You're getting people out of the house. You're pouring water on it. Um, in the case of the COVID crisis, we were dealing with work from home. Um, many businesses had already established uh, either telecommuting or remote work, but they just didn't have the bandwidth, the hardware and software in place to deal with it on the scale that we needed to. And in, depending on the sector, uh, there was a reconfiguring of the physical environment. And then a lot of responding to supply chain disruptions. And that plays into the, the recovery as well. And, and then to, Andrew, to your last point, even in the initial response, there may be ripple effects or there, or there may be flare-ups or hotspots that, that are driven by the crisis. And you're still responding to those as we are, as we are today in dealing with new areas of increased activity. Uh, while, you, while you're responding, the existing planning and measurement tends to remain in place and the existing tools and practices are employed, right? You look at your insurance, you look at contingency plans, you may, if you've advanced uh, to the level of maturity that you have playbooks for dealing with these things, you're running your playbooks, but you can't continue doing that forever. Eventually, you, you burn out. And so what needs to happen and what we're really just seeing business start to think about is the is the response and before we get into that let me let, let me run through a simplified model of the typical planning exercise if we think of planning as a combination of looking at growth and profitability across business as usual or the organic business plus strategic initiatives right what if you can't meet your targets through organic means then typically you'll look at m a activity or other investments uh, but that simple model typically holds year after year. We build up correlations and estimation models to support it. And, and businesses and those that are stakeholders in the investment community that set expectations all generally feel comfortable in coming up with targets and means of closing any gaps to targets. But let's look at what's changing with respect to the measures. If we, if we start looking at response on the next slide, uh, break this down into a number of areas. First, as I mentioned in, in response, there's an amplification of existing trends. In recovery, we've got 
significantly more work from home, work from anywhere. Under restrictions in, in, in many parts of the country, um, the entire workforce needed to work from home. Uh, that introduced a lot of noise in the business environment. In addition to working from home, many people were dealing with homeschooling schooling children, space restrictions, other distractions. Um, there was a, a positive benefit in that we got to see inside everyone's house and what sort of uh, doll collection they may have had or what, what the old movie posters they like to keep in their home office wall or um, a bit more personalization. But there was definitely an impact on innovation, right? If we couldn't get people together in a room, if we couldn't have hallway discussions, um, those brief informal interactions, uh, that has a negative impact on innovation. Business transformation has been common for decades now. It's typically been run in large phases in what you know, would have been referred to as a waterfall approach, right? Where design and a business case was put together and then a program that might run 18 months or more. Um, and so that's been amplified, right? The need to transform business has increased. And then we've got the impacts of social distancing restrictions. Uh, with the same amount of space, we, we have to accommodate keeping distance between people and that, that can translate into job sharing where some folks are working part-time from home, part-time in the office, um, and, and alternating with, uh, with their counterpart, maybe working a two or three day work week on site in the office and the remainder at home. The other trend that's been amplified is this disparity in um, economic prosperity for a lot of the workforce. You know, those with roommates, those living in a 700 square foot studio apartment, um, their work from home environment was significantly more constrained than than someone who had more space, more resources available. And then bandwidth and network access. And in rural, rural areas, we still have people connecting by DSL in 2020. So all of those things had been happening at one level, but they've certainly gotten amplified. In addition, we've seen a significantly uh, shortened product life cycle in a number of areas. We've seen some uh, products related to the response uh, grow phenomenally. Uh, one example that comes to mind is the online networking um, collaboration tool, Zoom, whose market cap equals that of the combined market cap of both Ford and GM today. Um, so significant changes to um, the supply chain and the tools that we were using, especially with respect to international uh, supply chains and, and multiple le levels of outsourcing. We saw greater focus, and we're seeing a greater focus now on resiliency over efficiency, and that those transformed business models that we talked about in the last slide are ch now changing demands, as, and the work from home, work from anywhere challenges are going to differentiate innovators. Those who, who can adapt to the shorter product life cycles will take market share. All of that, again, driving new performance measures. And if we look at the next area, seismic changes to models. And Andrew, I'm, I imagine you've seen this across the board, um, that legacy correlations in many sectors have collapsed. Um, travel industry, uh, significantly different than it was even 90 days ago, uh, and the same in pharma and other areas. We've also seen value migrating within and across sectors. The Zoom example I mentioned earlier, um, an extreme case of that. Risk tolerance has changed, and, and Andrew, that goes directly to uh, your discussion at the beginning of this webinar, and that uh, consumer appetites have uh, changed based on their expectation of, of future risk, and, and that's impacting business models. And ec underlying economic trends are shifting as well. Um, for the stimulus payments and a number of the responses around the world are, are driving what will over the longer term be um, increases in inflation and, and other macroeconomic trends that business has to deal with. And if we jump to the next slide, we can talk about another trend, another layer beyond, um, there's been social upheaval uh, as, as we all know recently, and, and that's an amplification and, and reinforcing a trend toward uh, stakeholder capitalism, it's certainly not comprehensive, uh, across all businesses, but it's certainly it is growing. 
And that means the social contract terms are changing between business and, and the community, and that's driving new measures, new expectations. And then let's go to the next slide, and we'll talk about one more, one more area. Um, and that's what we like to call the Sigma syndrome. Um, I'd use the GE as a case study here where, you know, under Six Sigma or Five Sigma, we really didn't differentiate well between quality and consistency. And we tended to treat everything we did in the world as if everything were a factory. And that's simply not the case. Um, we're seeing significant changes to performance measures there as well. That ties back to some of the, su the supply chain uh, discussion earlier on resiliency versus efficiency, right? There was um, the pendulum, I think, had swung very hard in the last decade uh, toward efficiency. Um, that had created these complex layers of supply chains, um, which had uh, hindered resiliency. And, and now, as we deal with crises, uh, we're seeing that we're paying the price for that, and we need we need to come up with new ways of uh, measuring performance there as well. Um, so what does all this mean? If we jump to the next slide, all five of these uh, have impacts on performance measurement. And what they imply is we need to transform, but we need to transform much more quickly than we, we're accustomed to. We can't we can't run those eighteen month programs. So what I propose, and if we go to the next slide, we give a quick overview of this. We, we know that the business as usual organic models have been disrupted, right? And so we can continue to look at strategic initiatives and quite a few uh, businesses have been successful with, with um, strategic M&A activity. Uh, many companies though, in response to the crisis and cost cutting measures have basically shut down new IT investments, new IT projects, maybe throttled back existing IT investments, but um, but significantly cut new ones. And, and actually, we need the opposite now. I mean, that as part of response, cutting those costs was, was, was the right move. But as we look at recovery and we look at coming up with transformed business models, we do need to come up with uh, uh, estimations, models, and the underlying business case and ROI for new investments. Um, I think that's key, Andrew, to how we start to uh, rebuild business to accommodate the changes in, in consumer spending, the changes in behavior, and to better prepare ourselves for any future crisis as well. I'd be interested, Andrew, in your thoughts on this. Absolutely, I, I agree, I think when we move from response to recovery, I think that there has to be that acknowledgement that many of these trends are around for quite a while, right? That this isn't a near term uh, event that's just gonna, going to temporarily disrupt and then go things go back to normal. So really embracing uh, some of the, the, the new way uh, is gonna be very important. The faster you do that, the more you're able to land, you know, get on your feet again and start moving forward as a company uh, versus reacting to, to those disruptions. And I think everything from the economic indicators we're seeing uh, suggests that the consumers are in a new mindset, that the economic damage that's coming out of this um, is it's going to take, you know, many quarters to, to to get back to any sort of normal trend again. Um, so I think there's a lot of data to back up the fact that we need, really need to embrace these strategies. I'd agree. And you, you, you'd mentioned um, uh, vaccines earlier and that, that plays directly into scenario analysis, right? I mean, if, um, if we think about herd immunity, um, my understanding, and this is certainly not my area of expertise, but my understanding from my reading is that to reach herd immunity, we need to cross a threshold of 60% infection rate. And that would be a combination of uh, people who have actually had the disease and recovered or who had taken a vaccine. And without a vaccine today, you know, granted the measure, the measures and the testing are inconsistent, uh, but at best we might be at a 5% infection rate today. And so um, depending on the timeline to develop a vaccine, uh, 
reaching herd immunity could take, as you as you mentioned, Andrew, a number of quarters before uh, before we're, we're at a more stable place. Precisely. So if you, if you think about this drop to zero and then actually stay that way for a long time, even then it's not even guaranteed that consumer habits and, and therefore business habits uh, go back to a new normal. We saw in China, right, vir virtually publishing that, you know, there was no cases in, in many provinces for, for quite a period of time. It was obviously the first to have the ramp up and then it, then it, had strict lockdown measures, but now they're dealing with it again. I mean, this is even after you know closing, rapid testing, um, restricting international travel, and even travel within cities and in provinces. You know, in some cases, and they're still having flare-ups. And so it's either everybody gets it, which we're a long ways from, and we know that the hospital capacity would would not be good in in that regard, nor would you know it. <laughs> be for the you know just from a health standpoint uh or you know we we restrict ourselves enough that the number of cases doesn't spread and it does go down but even then there's still a risk right if we go back to normal well normal uh spreads the disease so we, we are we are certainly in an environment that that we're going to be cognizant of this regardless of what that actual number of new cases is each day for quite a while right it's it's all about really tightening uh, cycle times on you know as as I tried to lay out in this discussion on not on transformation but but on enterprise planning as well right we have to think about scenario analysis in a new way and we have to think about planning in a new way in a much more rapid and and um, uh, uh, responsive way. I imagine you're seeing that uh, in private areas business now since the crisis. Yes, with most of the customers we're we are dealing with it's no longer acceptable to just settle on one forecast, right? It, the, there's so many assumptions, so many uncertainties that you really have to be thinking in terms of scenarios. You know, what what if the number of new cases increases? What if there's prolonged mandatory shutdowns? Uh what if unemployment goes back up again. Um, there's a lot to consider, and a lot of it's tied to the health crisis, a lot of it is tied to federal and fiscal policy, and you need to create a number of scenarios in order to really give yourself a, a holistic view of what those, what those risks are and be able to re react to them appropriately. All right. I will jump back in here. You guys, thank you both so much. That was um, great information. There's certainly a lot to consider as we start to come out of, of the ramifications of this pandemic. Um, that concludes today's webinar. If you have any questions for either Patrick or Andrew, please contact me using the contact information on the screen and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you all for joining us today and have a great day.